Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today, I want to do an early impression on a very rare, expensive, hard to find uh, indie fragrance. And it's actually from the house of Ensar Oud, uh, which is a house that I've been blessed enough to get to smell uh, thanks basically to the kindness and the generosity of the community. Uh, I never uh, actually gave uh, Ensar Oud a penny of my own money as of yet. Although, uh, there was one fragrance that really made me almost try to go pull the trigger on one until I saw the prices. And so I'm always one to say price is subjective because a thousand dollar fragrance to somebody who is, you know, a multimillionaire may not be, uh, seen as, as big of a purchase compared to somebody who, you know, just works a regular nine to five and makes 60 to $80,000 a year. Right. Uh, and so what when you start getting into those price tags i really feel like the the conversation has to be had you know somebody told me that um they actually had a chance to speak with the uh, guy that runs it ensar oud i don't know if his name's ensar or what but um he uh he brought up the issue of price and apparently uh it, he said that uh the uh, the guy who owns it he got um he got pretty uh you know, like put off and said, well, it's like a special purchase, view it as like a one-time special purchase kind of thing. And, but still, I mean, we start talking about a thousand dollars of fragrance or more. Some of these are even 1800, $2,500 for 30, 50 mil. You know, the conversation has to be had, right? And so this one that I'm wearing today, thanks to Nissan, by the way, for sending this to me, buddy. I've really, really appreciated wearing this and getting to know this. Uh, this is called Ensar E01 Assam. Now, apparently this Assam Pure Parfum is different from Ensar E01, just the regular E01. That's the one that everyone said, Ramsey, you have to try. It's this leathery, um, it's, apparently it's like a leather-based fragrance, and it's different from the uh, regular, this E01 Assam is different from the regular E01, apparently, is the way that I understand it. Now, one thing that you will notice just from me talking uh, for the first five minutes is that I am not a uh, oud specialist by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I've probably learned more about oud this year, 2022, thanks to my connection with Russian Adam and all of the uh, kind gifts you guys have sent me from places like Ensar Oud than I've ever had a chance to smell over my entire last, say, decade of hardcore fragrance consumption. Uh, and there's one Ensar Oud which is, is my favorite, and even with trying this E01 uh, Assam, it's still my favorite, and it's Tiger Lust. Tiger Lust, for me, is the one that I want a full bottle of. Now, maybe the regular E01... Uh, that came out in 2018. This E01 Assam apparently came out um, within the last couple years, I believe. This year, last year, something like that. Um, but the original E01 had a note of castorium in the top, okay? Uh, there is no castorium in the top in E01 Assam. So instantly, Probably, based on my taste, I would gravitate towards the original E01. However, this is an absolutely lovely fragrance, number one. Number two is I am basically not qualified to talk about this scent, like I said, because I am not an oud specialist by any stretch of the imagination. There is apparently two different types of oud in this. The other thing is this fragrance is an extremely long fragrance. It lasts forever forever and ever and ever. Uh, I've had it on my skin for eight and a half hours now, uh, an entire workday. It's basically the end of the workday. And even the initial spray that I've done, I can still smell clear as day, okay? Uh, and so this is a very long fragrance. It's a pure parfum, but um, it's, it's note listing is this. So instead of castorium in the top, like the regular E01, he uses ambergris, lots of ambergris in the top of this. And when I first smelled this, I thought, man, there is like some sort of weird, like um, leathery animalic oud coming through in the top. I don't think it's the oud. I'm starting to think it's actually the ambergris. I think he's used so much ambergris in the top of this fragrance 
that it just gives off this, uh, you know, sparkly, strange, leathery vibe, you know. At one point, it almost felt a little fishy, believe it or not. Um, and then I thought, no way am I smelling a fishy note. And I smelled it again, it was gone. And so some of this could be psychological since I know he uses a lot of ambergris and stuff like that. But there's no doubt the ambergris in the top adds this posh, sparkly, high-class quality to the fragrance. There's just no, no doubt about it. Uh, and then you have a note that I have zero familiarity with, and that's Fujian Cypress. Now, I love regular cypress in fragrance. I don't know how this Fujian Cypress uh, differs from regular cypress at all. It is a trend that I'm noticing in these high-end perfumes. They like to really list the exact specific note that they use. Uh, it almost gives them credibility to some extent. So Fujian Cypress, Lavender, Rosewood, and Nutmeg is how this fragrance starts off. And um, I'm just going to see if I can pull up what he actually says about the fragrance. I guess I should have pulled this up before I started just getting on here and talking. Uh, but here's basically what Ensaroud.com has to say about EO1 Assam. It says, not only is this among the highest quality oud fragrances that has ever been produced in spray format, the entire composition is infused into a high concentration, genuine raw ambergris tincture instead of just plain dot dot dot. I guess it's going to say perfumers, alcohol. Um, leather and oud go together like king and crown. There is no sweeter spot between the rustic allure of Ensar's artisanal, often mad oud world and popular perfume than this Ooh, delicious. Ooh, delicious. Oh, God. Um, addition to the queer tradition. Addition to the queer tradition. Uh, a rugged aroma that makes you wonder if Hemingway just lit up a Cuban or if Churchill's in town. <sighs> After 15 fragrant years, I finally took off my jungle jacket for a tie to dive headfirst into my debut perfume, spray perfume in crate number one. Since its first release, each iteration has had a unique flavor, still retaining the number one profile, but showing off a different dimension as we literally poured all we had of our precious distillations into this perfume. I approach perfume the way I do oud distillation. That's why number one is composed of the rarest, most expensive ingredients in all of perfumery, including copious amounts of prized ouds. So this fragrance is out of stock on the website, uh, just FYI. But I think it's like $1,000 for 30 mils. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's something ridiculous like that. Uh, and it says, not only, okay, already, not only is this among the highest quality oud fragrances that, I ever, that have ever been produced in spray format, along with oud Yusuf and oud Royale, the entire composition is infused in a high quality, high concentration, genuine raw ambergris tincture instead of just plain ethanol. Similar tinctures of this kind sell for around 400 pounds for 30 mil here. It is already included, but not just any ambergris, dot, dot, dot. I've literally been called stupid for insisting to use such high olfactory gems in a perfume. In fact, most critics are in professionally trained perfumers. Advocate using synthetics exclusively, and I see their point why sacrifice rare rose and oud instead of synthetics that are a thousand times cheaper. Not to mention, and this is a staple argument, you never have to worry about reproducing the scent, exclamation mark. I.e. it's scalable so you can sell a lot more. I insist on these insane insanities because to me and people like me, there is a difference. You smell low grade, lab made, oud, aka the oud note, and all you can do is laugh at how it's being compared to high, real high caliber oud. Most can't even tell, but to any oud novice, the difference is red and blue. Number one lets you exude wafts of tobacco-y, heavy, old school leather jacket aroma with an unmistakable Don Corleone. Don Corleone, kiss my hand, Campagno esteem, subtle but not soft, with a base that's all oud and vintage horse saddle leather. This edition is the closest to the original. In fact, it's an improvement in the most classic number one to date thanks to the addition of traditional Assamese oud. Aged for nine years, steeped in the late Sultan Caboose's own vintage ambergris, the scent, the same stones that went into oud royale. Okay, um... There's a lot to unpack there. I soaked up all the feedback we received since number one, the first launch and improved where folks felt it could be better. Rounded off some edges, some felt were a bit rough and introduced, I actually like the rough. That's one of my uh, negatives about this scent. 
I like my leather fragrances much rougher. This is extremely smoothed over, as he says, very like a pebble, you know, uh, rounded out by water over millions and millions of years. That's how this feels like. Um, introduced a couple of new ingredients to the ensemble that add tenacity and longevity, plus a tweak, a few tweaks to this new Pure Parfum edition make it even headier. The result is a strong composition that lingers longer, but doesn't overstay. Louder sillage with a gentleman's discretion. That's true. I'll agree with that. Top notes, Sultan Caboose's Ambergris. I have a little bit of a beef with that, but we'll get back to that. Lavender, Rosewood, Siam Wood, Nutmeg. Heart notes, Indian, Turkish, excuse me, an Aust Austrian Rose. Juhu, Jasmine, Tolu Balsam, Civet. Vintage Assam Oud, Vintage Timor Sandalwood, Tobacco, Vanilla, uh, Oak Moss, Ethiopian, and Hojari frankincenses and base notes actually lists Vietnamese oud as well it's not listed on his website but base notes does list that I don't know if that's true or not um no doubt number one is not your typical extra to parfum it's not supposed to be I wouldn't dream of topping the master queers that came before nor do I subscribe to modern industry standards of how long how loud and how far this is an indie queer that's limited and rare where I simply wanted to add an oud inspired rendition to the legacy of queer de Russie, etc etc and offer perfume lovers the chance to experience just how amazing and exalting a fixative artisanal oud can be in EO number one you pass third base to smell oud and leather, drunk and in love, and a perfume that's a, a first in a vibrant queer heritage that's been turning top hats and making hearts melt for decades. Okay, so uh, that's a lot, right? And I will tell you my initial thoughts. And again, I am uh, no expert on this, okay? Uh, I am not going to bow down to its praises, all right? I'll tell you that right now. Uh, I think that this is good, but maybe a little bit overhyped or oversold even from the language, but I do think it's very good. In fact, if I was a mil if I was a if I was Elon Musk, okay, this could be my everyday scent. This could be my throw it on, it's every day, whatever. But is this a special occasion scent for me? No. This is not a special occasion scent for me. This is too um <laughs> I don't want to use the word common because the way that they make it seem is that it's everything but common, but this could be like a daily driver. If you're, if you're that rich, okay, if you're Elon Musk, or I guess you don't have to be Elon Musk to spend a thousand bucks on a bottle of perfume, but if you're so rich that spending a thousand dollars on a bottle of perfume every couple months when you run through this, because this is your daily driver and you're going to spray it eight times, right, and go to work, um, if that's your thing... This could be a fantastic daily driver scent. Absolutely fantastic. The problem is, when I spend $1,000 on 30 mils, I don't want a daily driver. I want something that knocks me off of my chair. I want something that moves me. This doesn't move me. I don't know why it doesn't move me. It doesn't. I also think it's a little bit disingenuous to loot, to use Sultan Caboose's Ambergris. I mean, he was just a guy like us. Yes, he was the Sultan. But, I mean, he's buying fragrance materials and fragrances and ambergris just like you or I could. Just because it's his doesn't make it any different from, you know, the best quality ambergrises out there, right? I mean, he was, yes, he was the sultan, but he's still just buying stuff off of the market. So, you know, um, in, in the... Um, so when you first spray this fragrance, you basically get this, uh, like I said, heavy ambergris vibe. That's the very first thing that I got was ambergris. And even now that it's been, I reapplied it about half an hour ago. Even now, I'm just getting lots of ambergris, which is great. Ambergris is a fantastic scent. It's a beautiful smell, right? Uh, and it really does feel like you start to get some of the... Uh, oud coming out from underneath and the vintage Assam Oud as they call it is Oud from uh, Assam India is the largest Oud producing region in India so you see Assam Oud lots of times right um, I can't speak to the I can't speak to the um quality of the Oud because I honestly don't know but I will just give you an example of what I was thinking today to me, um, I have enjoyed wearing this today just as much as I enjoyed wearing Emwage Silver Oud, okay? 
Amlage Silver Oud also uses Assam Oud. And uh, I, I got my 100 mil bottle. It's on the way for $375 shipped. No tax, no nothing. It was a discount code at Max Aroma or something. 100 mils, brand new, 375, right? Uh, this is 30 mils for a thousand bucks. Now, the hardcore Ensar Oud people are going to be like, you can't compare Amwaj's Silver Oud's Assam Oud to Ensar's. Fine. And I will, I will, I will agree with that fact. Okay. You probably cannot. But the way that the two fragrances made me feel as far as when I'm wearing them, they're just the same. I, this does not make me feel special. This feels like a daily driver of an Oud fragrance. It's nice. I think EO number one, just the regular EO one is the one that would probably move me because the, 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 if I, at this point, now that I've, I've done, I've, I've given Ensar Oud three full wears now. One was Tiger Lust, which is by far my favorite, by far. None of the other ones can even compete with Tiger Lust to me. And I've worn EO number two, which was my least favorite. That's the musk heavy one, uh, which somebody came at me with the exact same thing that, uh, that he wrote in this article. They were like, yeah, but you only wore it once. There's no way you could know what it's about after one wear because he uses these, you know, uh, real ambergris instead of perfumers, alcohol and, you know, you have to wear it for weeks before you really begin to appreciate it. Fine. I mean, I could tell you off of first wear, uh, EO number two is not my thing. Although, uh, maybe if I did continue to wear it, I could learn to enjoy it. Uh, and I'm sure the musks in the dry down were everything that people say they are. But again, that just felt like it didn't, it didn't feel like a special fragrance to me. Again, it didn't feel like a special, like if I wanted to wear something on Christmas, it's not going to be one of these Ensar fragrances. It's, I mean, hell, I'd rather wear um, Feeling Aguil or one of those, one of those long lost vintage gems that sell on eBay for $800. Dunhill Blend 30 or, you know, um, Ted Lapidus Pour from 1978. I mean, I'd rather wear something like that at this point, honestly. And there are oud fragrances that move me, and I do have some experience with with real oud. Like I said, I've got the Russian oud. Uh, I've done many uh, videos on Russian Adams line. You know, I talked about things like antiquity, and I do have a full bottle now of War and Peace. And so, um, you know, I talked about oud zen, and I and I've kind of dived into the real oud game, if you will, now. And there are some things that move me and there are some things that not, that, that do not move me. One thing that does not move me about this house is the price. I'll tell you that right now. Because Russian Adam, uh, his fragrances, as far to Ensar's fragrances, to me, quality-wise, I can't see any difference. And people are going to say, yeah, but, Rush, but Ensar Oud uses the you know, ambergris and, you know, real musks as underneath and this, that, or whatever. I get to this nose, they're identical as far as my pleasure when I wear them. When I wear them, this is not a thousand dollar fragrance and this is not a $250 fragrance. They are equal. In fact, sometimes the Russian Atom fragrances I think are even better. Uh, and so that is the issue that I'm having with Ensar right now. I actually went to go buy a bottle of Tiger Lust. And then I saw the price and I was like, forget that. I'm not giving them a grand. Uh, and, you know, maybe it is the greatest olfactory gem ever created, but it's not worth a thousand bucks to me. And that goes back to the, to the value for money of perfume. You know, when I can go buy, you know, I was looking today, there's a 1980s bottle of Shalimar on Mercari for $35 shipped. I would just rather wear that. I get just as much enjoyment out of Shalimar, Mitsuko, Le Bleu, uh, Val de Nuit. I mean, those old Guerlains, uh, the Amouages. I get just as much enjoyment. Even the Rojas that I have. I mean, uh, Bortnikovs. I get just as much enjoyment wearing those as I do something like Ensar. This is... This is uh, he's created this name for himself, I feel like. And... Um, the name carries weight in 
certain parts of the world. You know what I mean? He big weight, heavy weight. Uh, I mean, people are willing to just empty out their wallet. They hear Ensar, they trust it. Boom. He's created this, uh, he's created this wonderful brand recognition for himself among the, uh, real elite. And I see why to some extent and then to others, I don't. It, it almost feels a little bit like the Roja effect. You know, Roja comes in. He prices his fragrances way above the market and everyone instantly, it's a Veblen good. You know what a Veblen good is? It's a good that basically uh, is desirable because it's more expensive, right? And that's a little bit of Ensar Oud to me. Now, to be fair, I do really like this. Um, you really start to get this um, animalic civet, which begins to come out, but it's restrained, as he said. Whenever I, I just did my civet video uh, yesterday, you can go check it out. Top 50 civet countdown with 11 honorable mentions. Well, 10 plus one is how I, is how I called it. And, um, you know, I, for me, I want a civet scent. I'm going to wear Koros. I'm going to wear Furio. Um, I'm going to wear Tietro Alla Scala, the most beautiful, you know, uh, she, floral chifra oriental floral chifra with uh this civet in the in the base just to perfection right from the 80s and this is not what i think about when i think about civet i mean yes there is civet in there yes it's a little bit animalic um you know it's mixing with the oud i really like the frankincense and the dry down i really really like the frankincense and the dry down um but for some reason you know, there's, there is, uh, there is supposedly tobacco in the base and there is this leathery feel to the fragrance. Um, but I don't know why it doesn't move me. I, I, I wish I could stand up here and say, wow, this is the best fragrance I've ever smelled. I'm going to mortgage my house and go buy a bottle. Um, or I'm going to sell off a couple bottles and go buy one of this because I don't want to wear anything else because this is so good. Unfortunately, I just don't feel that way. I have to be real with you guys. Um, I feel very blessed to get to try it, honestly, because there's no way I would other otherwise get the chance to. Um, and, you know, it is extremely long-lasting, although I do reapply. So even if I just wear like an EDT or an EDP, I mean, it doesn't bother me because I can reapply. I'll bring the bottle with me to work, you know, or a decant or something or wherever I go, you know. Um, and many of my fragrances will last six to eight hours anyway, so it doesn't matter. I mean, I can wait till I get home and reapply. But I do reapply throughout the day. So this fragrance, which seems like it lasts 20, 24 hours, honestly, it seems like it's going to go on forever. Um, you know, it's... It does what it does very well and very competently, but it's not worth a thousand dollars to me. That's that's basically what it kind of comes down to, and um, you can tell there's multiple types of real oud in here. You can tell there's multiple types of real rose in here. There's multiple types of frankincense in here. I mean, there's there's many multiple there's many uh, high end ingredients that are very special in this fragrance, and yet. For some reason, it doesn't, you know, I know that the special ingredients are in here, but it doesn't coordinate to my brain going special fragrance, if that makes sense. Um, I don't know why. I wish I knew why. Uh, now, this one did. I, I wore this as my scent of the day one day, Tiger Lust. I wanted a bottle of this. This is full bottle worthy for me. E01 on its own maybe full bottle worthy. I like it rougher. You know, I like the rougher, more animalic scent. So maybe just the regular E01, the leather, is the one that's going to move me more than this one. This seems like a more wearable version. Um, and it is a pure parfum, so it does sit very close to the skin. Uh, and But I could totally see this being like a signature scent for somebody who is really high up in a position of authority or power. Uh, or if you're just into fragrances like we are, you know, this this would be a fantastic addition. I just, 
I just uh, would not spend this kind of money on this particular one. I would probably go for, I'd probably just go blind by EO1, honestly, at this point. Uh, since I already have Tiger Lust, but I really did like Tiger Lust. So, you know, the ingredients seem high quality. It seems extremely wearable. Um, I wish I had more to say about it. It just, you know, it's kind of maybe one of these downfalls of some of these houses that, um, you know, Rich Mitch gives many of these houses, uh, a little bit of grief because maybe they're not like professionally trained perfumers and, um, you know, sometimes the blending is done differently at a house like Ensar or Arise Le Doré or Bortnikoff than it is done at Dior or Chanel or, you know, Guerlain or something like that. Uh, the way that they blend the ingredients through distillation is sometimes different than the way that it's blended through a master perfumer. Uh, and maybe some of that's kind of peeking out here because the, the knock on some of these houses is that they kind of rely on the strength and quality of the ingredients to do the work for them. And maybe because, you know, maybe because, um, it doesn't all come together into like a cohesive whole for me. It doesn't come together into a, a, the sum. The sum of its parts does not create this piece that's greater than the sum of its parts. You know what I mean? It's like um, all of the individual components are beautiful. And that is one thing I do want to mention. Actually, I do want to be fair because while you're wearing this, there is a very beautiful aspect to this fragrance that I've noticed wearing it today. And that is that it's almost like you can stop time. And you can pick out, you want to go smell the beautiful rose, you can do that. You want to go smell the ambergris, you can do that. You want to smell the civet, you can do that. You want to smell the oud, you can do that. You want to smell the uh, tobacco, you can do that. You want to smell the frankincense, you can just go use your brain and pinpoint on a note and bam, you will smell it. Um, and it is, uh, you know... That's a special attribute of a fragrance. And some, you know, some fragrances have this development to them where you, you don't get the oud, you don't get the frankincense, you don't get the rose until a certain point in the dry down. This one, it feels like there's this, you know, blob of ingredients and you can just kind of go, I want to smell the rose. And you're there, you know. I want to smell the oud. You're there. Um... And yet, when you add it all up like a puzzle, it doesn't seem to fit into a cohesive whole, to me, to my nose. And I felt very similar about EO2, and that would probably stop me from blind buying EO1, to be honest with you. As much as I want to smell EO1 and wear it and enjoy it, um, I guess I'm just not on the Ensar Oud bandwagon. I mean, maybe it's just my love of classical vintage fragrances. Um, maybe it's because like yesterday, I'll give you an example. Yesterday after my Civet video, I wore Jacques Bogart Furio to bed, which I got like five bottles of for like a hundred bucks when they were on sale. A hundred bucks total for five, not a hundred bucks each, but a hundred dollars for 500 mil. Uh, it was, it was like $115 total or something with, with shipping or tax or I forgot what it was, but I got an amazing deal on those bottles. It's a discontinued 80s fragrance that Thierry Vasser worked on, who's the current in-house perfumer for Guerlain. I enjoyed wearing that fragrance to bed last night more than I'm enjoying E01 number one Assam. That should not happen to a thousand dollar. This should be, I mean, there should be rainbows and sparks. Mountains should move when you apply a thousand dollar perfume. <sighs> And it just doesn't for me. For me, it just doesn't. For you, it may. Okay, I'm not I'm not saying that if you think this is the greatest fragrance of all time, wear it. Please, wear it, buy it, be happy with it. Do not let me rain on your party. Don't let me, you know, bust your bubble. Don't make me piss on your parade. Any Whatever you want to use, do, don't let me ruin your party with Ensar. Because, um, 
Like I said, there is some things I've smelled from them that I really like. I haven't smelled very much. I do have another one that was sent to me by Nissan called Jungle, uh, Jungle Oud or something. And so you will see more videos from me on them, but, um, it, it's, uh, it's a tough sell. It really is a tough sell for me. Um, they, uh, these, these, these indie houses, um, you know, I think value for money for, for me right now, especially when you've got this, you have this collaboration that's about to happen with Russian Adam and Dmitry Bortnikov, two of the best. They started Feel Oud, the Oud Distillers, and now they're kind of bringing their forces together after all of these years. And I know Russian Adam has always been very cognizant of, um, you know, wanting to be inclusive. Yes, he's got the $400 fragrances, but he also has the $80 fragrances, the 100 the, the 150 the 250s And, uh, you know, whenever he reduced his juice quantity recently, uh, or, well, a couple collections ago, many collections ago, actually, not so recently, but when he went from like 50 mil to 30 mil bottles or whatever it was, he also reduced the price. Interestingly enough, he could have left the price alone, but he, he didn't. And so I think if I'm going to dive into this type of perfume, especially with the, you know, relationship that I have with Adam and I've really gotten to know him and I think he's an amazing guy. I think he's kind of, he's one of a kind. I mean, you know, he loves fragrances through and through. Um, and he wants as many people as possible to experience it and he wants it to be fair. You know, he... Uh, just as a, as a capitalist, the fact that his fragrances sell on the secondary market for instantly double or triple what they are put out for means that that's what they're worth. He could put them up for double or triple and they would sell. Uh, but he is literally choosing to keep the prices where they are, uh, I think out of an abundance of goodwill to the, to the perfume public. That's the kind of guy that I would like to support. And since for me, these kind of works, you know, uh, forget the, oh, I use the Sultan Bin Kabus's special ambergris that he, you know, took a shower in one day. That doesn't move me. How these fragrances wear, and I'm not just saying this, I'm just using this as an example, right? Uh, if this is gonna be 250, and I know you can't find this anymore, but let's just say hypothetical. If this is 250 and this is a thousand, uh, I'm gonna support Russian Adams' work. So that's kind of where I'm at with this whole indie niche thing. I really do like Bortnikov's work though as well. So I can't wait for the collab between them. I also really want a bottle of Ottoman Empire. I don't have one yet. I want a bottle of Antiquity and I want a bottle of Ottoman Empire and I cannot find either. And so I think I would just rather save my money instead of, you know, uh, giving it to NSAR and um, wait until Ottoman Empire pops up somewhere or Antiquity pops up somewhere and, and spend it there. I think I'll be happier with the value for money there, right? So um, unfortunately, that's kind of my thoughts on it. It's a, it's a great fragrance, I think. The ingredients are spectacular. Uh, I've really enjoyed wearing it, but it did not produce, you know, the firework effect that I kind of expected. So, uh, I, I mean, I can't lie to you guys. I have to be, I have to be on, I have to continue to be honest with you guys because, you know, that's what, that's the whole reason I started this channel is there was too much bullshit out there. And that applies to both the good and the bad. And so I want to be honest on both sides of the coin. But if you get a chance to smell this, it is beautiful. It is absolutely stunning. Um, it's it's uh, beautiful ingredients, you know, some of the best ambergris, the best dudes, all that stuff. But the composition just doesn't just doesn't move me. So, uh, but thank you, Nissan, for sending this to me. I hope you guys appreciate this video. If you have experience with this, E O one Assam Pure Parfum, do let me know. Um, and I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on it. So thanks everyone for watching. Cheers, guys. See you again tomorrow with another video. Bye now.